it comes down to trying to expose yourself to the best things that humans have done and then try to bring those things in to what you're doing. I mean, Picasso had a saying, he said, good artists copy, great artists steal. Good artists copy, great artists steal. It's unclear whether Picasso actually said this. However, the general concept can be traced back to many great artists throughout history. In fact, whoever was the first to attribute this quote to Picasso was most likely thinking of a quote by an American literary critic, Lionel Trilling. Immature artists imitate, mature artists steal. Trilling probably had in mind the words of English poet T.S. Eliot, who wrote in his work, The Sacred Wood, Essays on Poetry and Criticism. Immature poets imitate, mature poets steal. Eliot had interchanged the terminology used by author W.H. Davenport Adams, who while extolling the works of famed poet Alfred Tennyson wrote, of Tennyson's assimilative method, when he adopts an image or a suggestion from a predecessor and works it into his own glittering fabric, I shall give a few instances, offering as the result and summing up of the preceding inquiries a modest canon, that great poets imitate and improve, where a small one steal and spoil. The evolution of this quote demonstrates its premise. No factitious work of art is completely original. It is always inspired by and builds on something that came before. Picasso's Les Demoiselles d'Avignon is widely considered to be the first 20th century masterpiece, as well as a piece of critical influence into the early development of both Cubism and modern art. The work portrays five nude females. While working on Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, Picasso had several ancient Iberian sculptures in his studio, which he had acquired from an acquaintance who had stolen them from the Louvre Museum in Paris. It was from these sculptures that Picasso would derive the faces of the Lethbury women. Oh, and he would later return these statues upon discovering they were stolen. But the faces of the two remaining women do not share the same inspiration. In fact, they bear a striking resemblance to the mask of the Dan people of Africa. It is not surprising when we find out that while working on Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, Picasso had visited an exhibition of African art at the Ethnographic Museum in Trocadero, which had featured these masks. Picasso was intrigued by them and would go on to become a keen collector of African art, which influenced many of his works between 1907 and 1909, a time known as Picasso's African period. Picasso was also influenced by other artists, going as far as to create his own versions of famous works that came before him, as a sort of tribute to the artists he admired, including Femme d'Agir dans le Parlement by Delacroix, Las Meninas by Velasquez, and perhaps most notably, Les Déjeuners sur l'Herbe by Manet. Actually, this painting is based on a section of a print by an engraving by Ramondi, who had designed it after a painting by Raphael. And of course, just like Picasso, many artists were and are influenced and inspired by other creatives. Many film directors have used paintings as inspiration for many scenes and shots of, for their movies. The Imaginarium of Dr. Panassas draws inspiration for its landscape from the work of Grant Wood. Inherent Vice invokes imagery from Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper. The tower in the 1927 movie Metropolis was inspired by a 1563 painting called The Tower of Babel by Pieter Bugel the Elder. In Labyrinth, the dizzying rule-bending stairs is based on relativity, a lithograph print by a Dutch artist M.C. Esker, whose work was also inspirational in creating several of the mind-bending scenes from Inception. Film writers are also inspired by other forms of creativity, such as literature. Disney's The Lion King is based on Shakespeare's play Hamlet. Both the 1998 and 1961 The Parent Trap movies 
are derived from a 1949 German novel called Lotta and Lisa. Rambo First Blood is based on the novel First Blood by David Morrell. Mrs. Doubtfire is based on a young adult's novel titled Alias Madame Doubtfire by Anne Fine. Coolus is an adaption of Jane Eyre's 1815 novel Emma. Alva Hitchcock acquired the film rights to the novel Psycho to make his movie by the same name. And even Pitch Perfect was adapted from the non-fiction book about competitive a cappella at American universities by Mickey Rapkin. Of course, authors are also inspired by other authors. Bridget Jones Diaries by Helen Fielding, which is of course the inspiration for the three Bridget Jones movies, is obviously based on Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. Naturalist author Jack London's Call of the Wild is based on a missionary writer, Egerton R. Young's, non-fiction book, My Dogs in the Northland. The work of French author Alexander Dumas, which has spawned many movies, The Three Musketeers, is actually largely based on a little book called The Memoirs of Monsieur d'Artagnan by Gatine de Cortes de Santres. And of course, it is well known that Shakespeare's tragedy Romeo and Juliet was inspired by the 1562 narrative poem the tragical history of Romeo and Juliet. Artists have adapted, been inspired by, and based their works on the creations of artists before them since time immemorial. The earliest contributions to aesthetic theory are usually considered to stem from the philosophers of ancient Greece, they defined art as mimesis, the imitation of the visible world. In Book 10 of Plato's The Republic, Socrates says to Glaucon on the topic of mimesis, Do you see that there is a way in which you can make them all yourself? What way? asked Glaucon. An easy way enough, or rather, there are many ways in which the feat might be quickly and easily accomplished, none quicker than that of turning a mirror round and round. You would soon enough make the sun and the heavens, and the earth and yourself, and other animals and plants, and all the other things of which we were just now speaking, in the mirror. Socrates goes on to discuss the process of the creation of a painting of a bed saying that the artist who creates the bed was inspired by a real bed made by a carpenter, and therefore the painting is an imitation of that physical bed. However, he suggests there is one more artist, a third, who would have to come before both of them, and from whom both would get their idea. That is the ideal bed. Socrates says, Shall we then speak of him as the natural author or maker of the bed? Yes, replies Glaucon inasmuch as by the natural process of creation he is the author of this and of all other things. And so it would seem to me, if you trace the process of any artistic creation back by its inspiration, you will eventually come to creation itself, demonstrating that no fictitious work of art is completely original. The only truly original work of art is, and will remain throughout eternity, the work of the divine artist, who created everything from nothing. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So I would agree with Steve Jobs. We should expose ourselves to the best things that humans have done and try to bring those things into whatever we're doing. But better yet, we should seek to expose ourselves to the best things that the greatest artist does and seek to bring those into everything we do. <laughs>